Well, no historical event that might um, trigger this vision is known. When it occurs, Ezekiel has 14 months to reflect on his inaugural vision in verse 1. However if, um, however, if one assumes that the Synax of chapter 4 occurred almost immediately after his call to the prophetic office, and that the 390-day period of lying on his left side and 40-day period on his right side transpired successively, this vision must have interrupted the second phase of that Synax. The chronology appears problematic on the surface, but Ezekiel, if Ezekiel is not continuously immobilized, as I have suggested, we could have received the visitors in his house, which in turn precipitated his vision. In other words, as we find often in the Bible, things aren't necessarily, because one chapter follows another, it isn't necessarily sequential. Often things are set up thematically. So he could still be in the middle of his, you know, lying down and doing all this kind of stuff. And that could very well have prompted the visit of the elders to his house, you know, trying to either listen to him or figure out what's going on or admonish him. And it seems like he's, while they're there in the house, he, apparently his body's still there, but he goes into a trance or of some sort. And, and I suppose the elders are watching all of this. And, you know, this isn't a dream where he goes to sleep and sees something at night like we saw in Daniel. This is, bang! And the, the imagery is so vivid that you have this guy, his upper body looks like a man, but his bottom half looks like fire. So he's sitting there with the elders, and then he sees this guy. Again, this gets into some of the questions about Ezekiel's sanity, I mean, because this is pretty dramatic. And then the guy goes up to him, grabs him by the hair, pull, seems to pull him out of his body, bring him up between heaven and earth and transfer him hundreds of miles away. Of course, this is before trains or planes or cars. And boom, he's there at the temple and he's watching. You know, nobody can see him, but he's watching. And now remember, what was Ezekiel's now again, in the ancient world, your expected vocation very much comes to you from your family. What was Ezekiel's vocation? He's a priest. And we begin the book by, he's in his 30th year, so the assumption is he would start his service in the temple. But now we're going to get a vision for what's happening in the temple. Does it sound like Revelation? Yes, it does. And it's going to sound more like it when we get to chapter 9. And, and again, when we, if you remember when we studied the book of Revelation, I, said, I made the comment that I think in many ways the book of Revelation is a revisiting of the Old Testament prophetic books. You know, very much a context of Exodus, but also Ezekiel and Daniel. Because we see very similar things in Ezekiel and Daniel in the book of Revelation. Now, obviously, the book of Revelation comes far later. But I think the book of Revelation takes the revelation of Jesus Christ and now updates the Old Testament prophecy with respect to the new information that Jesus gave, which was his life, death, and resurrection. So, so here's Ezekiel. He's transported into the temple, and he's watching uh, to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the fourth gate of the inner court, where the idol that provokes jealousy stood. Now, I bet you your, some of your translations have different translations than that. Anybody else? Is it idol that provokes jealousy in your translation? Idol of jealousy. Idol of jealousy. All idol of jealousy. Okay. What does that mean? What so the, the NIV 2011 is trying to clarify because the image of jealousy, and you think, well, what's that about? What, what, what an image of jealousy mean? Well, 
if you go back into the book of if you go back to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image of anything in heavens above or the earth beneath. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous, jealous God. Now, let's talk about the difference between jealousy and envy. Often we use these two things synonymously, but they're really not. What is the difference between jealousy and envy? That's right. Um, we might talk about a jealous wife or a jealous husband. Um, if we talked about an envious wife, what might be a story that goes around goes around about an envious wife? Okay, want to be like somebody, or wants to have what someone else has. A jealous wife is what? That's right. Doesn't want to share her husband. Or a jealous husband doesn't want to share his wife. But in our culture, jealousy's gotten a bad rap and envy seems okay. That's right. <laughs> Something funny has happened in our culture where, oh, you shouldn't be jealous. But envy is the engine of our economic system. <laughs> so... See, and so when you read the Bible, it's reversed. Because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. What is he saying when he says he's a jealous God? And he says it in the context of idolatry. Know What's that, Gene? No other God besides me. No other God besides me. The jealous wife says to her husband, you shall have no other woman beside me. Now, these things... Jealousy can be a negative thing. Again, I've been talking about OJ in the context of Solomon at the at the eleven o'clock service, and I mean some of the ironies of the OJ situation was that he was insanely jealous of his ex-wife, but OJ, you know, always had women on the side. But even after the divorce, oh, you better not have anybody else. And so, you know. This kind of thing, um, this kind of thing goes on. But so now the image that the image of jealousy, or as in the newer translations, the image that provokes jealousy, it's essentially saying, well, what does God say about his house in Jerusalem? That's right. It's his house. Now, if, if you were to come home, and let's say you're married, and you find your spouse has another man or a woman in your house, in your bed, you would say, that's my house. That's my bed. You're my spouse. And, and I would say that is an appropriate jealousy because you are jealous for what rightly, what you have claims on. So when the idol that provokes jealousy, where the idol that provokes jealousy stood, so, so Ezekiel is transported to the temple and what is in the temple? An idol. An idol. Now, why is it that God in the Ten Commandments says, you shall not make an image of me? Okay, well, nobody knows what he looks like, but couldn't God say, oh, here I am, this is what I look like? Well, that's God. Not how so? Well, God can't be contained in an idol. He's so much bigger than that. Okay. It would be like, let's say you're a, um, 
Let's say you're a great chef and you're known for making cakes. Um, now you might like it if people know you for your cakes because you make great cakes and you enjoy that. But what if they thought you were a cake? And they praise the cake more than we'll let them. <laughs> yeah, it's okay to praise you because of the cake, but to say you are a cake says, well, I, you are your creation. God is in a sense saying, you cannot take anything in your experience, make an image of that, and say that's me. That would, again, be like saying that the chef is a cake. And God says, I am not a cake. I am not something that can be manipulated. I am not something that can be portrayed. I am not something that can be used. Yes? But the other thing about that is it could be that the image wouldn't translate well with all the different nations because if you said someone's a cake today, they kind of think you are saying they're pretty good quickly or something. That is exactly right. Because once you define God in this way, suddenly you have all of the dynamics of perception and culture and conflict that we naturally have within this world. And God says, if you call me a cake, now people are going to hate me because they say, well, what kind of cake is he? Well, he's a strawberry cake. And people say, well, I don't like strawberries. And that's the problem. You're exactly right. Exactly. And, and, and on one hand, we might look at that and say, I'm happy to be known by what I do. And God is. God says, you know, I'm happy to be known by my creation, by the glory in it. But if you think she is only the cake lady, she might say, I am also a mother. I am also a daughter. I am also a, an intellectual, I am also an artist, I am also an athlete, I am also blah, 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 blah. You cannot define God in these narrow senses. And, and if you think about that message, that, and again, we're going to talk about this actually, we're going to talk about this at 11 o'clock a little bit. When you think about, you find all of these commonalities between Israel and the nations around them. It's just natural. It's because of culture. But when you think about this message, you have to stop and say, how on earth did they get an idea like that? Because that is so amazingly insightful about a being able to create all of this. It is so right that you have to say, how on earth did the Jews, and only the Jews, come up with this idea? Because, again, if you look at all the rest of the cultures in human history, what do you find? I don't. Even Hinduism, which is geographically a long ways from the Jews, Hindus kind of have an idea that, well, uh, Brahma and Ganesh and, and all of these gods are manifestation of the one God. But only the Jews say, you know what? If you think about this long enough, it would stand to reason that such a being would not want to be reduced to a woman with lots of hands or an elephant or a creature with a monkey face, or a man who's blue, because that is naturally a diminishment of it. Now, there is an exception to this that come up, comes up in Colossians 1. What is, Colossians 1 says, someone is the image of the invisible God. Jesus. Jesus. Now, this is interesting, and in a sense, what, what we're saying is that Jesus is a low-resolution representation of the, invis of, the, of the invisible God. What do I mean by low-resolution? 
One we can handle. <laughs> One we can handle. That's exactly right. If you open up a page in your computer and you see all these little thumbnails and they just show up on your screen, beep, 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 beep. Well, it's because they're low resolution. It's because the data is limited so that you can see it and know it right away. That's low resolution. And, and you get this, and the Christian church had to work this out as it was working through Christology when they understood that when Jesus came, Jesus would say funny things like, the I don't know the date. And you'd say, well, what do you mean you don't know the date? Jesus would talk about his own limitations. Well, why would Jesus have limitations? Yeah. That's right. Because <clears throat> he also has to be a man. So, but, but that is the exception to the rule. The rule here is, you shall not make anything. Now, for God to make something, well, you can argue with him. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> but you shall not make something and call it me and represent me. So now Ezekiel is at the temple, and the first thing he sees is an idol, an image. And there before me was the glory of the, Lord, of the God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen on the plain. So if you go all the way back to chapter 1, this vision that, that we saw then, and these two visions are going to connect. Then he said to me, Son of man, look to the north. So I looked, and at the entrance of the north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. Then he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary. But you will see, but you will th see things even more detestable. Okay. What does he mean by things that will drive me from my sanctuary? What is the story in the beginning of what happens in the world? So, God makes the world. He separates the, the sea from the dry land. He makes a garden or an orchard, because it's filled with trees, so some translations say orchard, because I always hear trees. Either way, garden, orchard, same business. And this is Eden. And you have God in heaven. What is, and again, I've mentioned a number of times, what don't we see in Eden? An altar. There's no altar in Eden. Why not? That's right. Because, in a sense, heaven is God's throne, and Eden is his, well, it's his garden. It's the royal gardens. You've heard about the royal gardens of Versailles. You've heard about the, the, um, the, the gardens, of the hanging gardens of Babylon. Eden is his garden, and the man and the woman are what? Sinless. Sinless. Caretakers. And caretakers. And so that after they rebel, what does God do? There's a separation. Heaven and earth are divorced. And the man and the woman are kicked out of the garden, so they can't eat from the tree of life. And one of the interesting things that happened, and it's really fun looking back at old maps, because if you look at the medieval period, very often they would put Eden on the map. Now, when we hear about that today, what do we think? Okay. If I say, okay, I am going to go on vacation and I'm going to go visit the Garden of Eden, what would you say to me? <laughs> and so, but if I went there, would I find the tree of life and the angel with the flaming sword? No. No. What's going on? What happens here in the fall? You can't go to the garden. Can't go to the garden of Eden. Why not? Not there. God's no longer there. God's no longer there. See, it wasn't, in a sense, the trees and the stuff that made Eden. What made Eden? 
God's present. Man living with God. So now, when it comes to so the Israelites are taken out of Egypt and they make the tabernacle and all of the decorations of the tabernacle, and the same is true when, they, when Solomon builds the temple, all of the decorations of the temple are prescribed and, well, what do they put in the temple? There are, there are a couple of huge statues in the temple. Do you know what they are? Cherubim. Cherubim. And cherubim are, are carved on the walls. And what else is on the walls of Solomon's temple? Do you know? Pomegranates. Pomegranates. Animals? Um, I, they didn't mention animals, and there certainly isn't a snake. No. <laughs> but they great vines. But there are trees and, and fruit-bearing plants that now, why would God want the temple decorated with these things? That was reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. Exactly. <laughs> what the temple was Good job, <laughs> was the connection. Again, we're trying to overcome the division. What the garden was was the connection between heaven and earth. And so... Why would God want these? Now, here again, this is tricky because God tells Solomon to put these images into the temple. And so he puts these two cherubim. And our best understanding of what these were like was they kind of had the body of a lion, maybe the face of a woman, and they had these wings. And then the ark went in under these wings. Why would God allow those images of that to be in the temple? And so what's happening in the temple is there's no representation of God. But in a sense, what the temple does is get the room ready for him. And then if you read in the book of Kings, the glory of the Lord comes and fills the temple and the priests have to get out. So in a sense, what the temple is, is God's room. What used to be in the garden, now it's in the temple. That's exactly right. It used to be in the garden, is now in the temple. It's God's room. So now Ezekiel comes spirited in to look at the temple, and what's he finding? An idol. And at the end of the idols, and you're going to see even more detestable things. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court, and I looked, and I saw a hole in the wall. And he said to me, Son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and saw a doorway there. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked and detestable things that they are doing there. So I went in and looked, and I saw portrayed all over the walls all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. What is God showing him? How far man has fallen yeah. from his relationship with God. Now, now let's talk about let's talk about this uh, let's talk about this system of clean and unclean. So you have the camp and then in the Old Testament, you have these dietary laws. And you had clean and unclean animals. Now, what's that about? That's a really hard question. And, and even today's scholars continue to go back and forth on it. Like, you can't eat bacon. Bacon, you can't eat lobster. Um, so we go, ah, it's <laughs> But now, what's happening here in this vision is that the. Now, again, if you look at, let's say, the story of Noah's Ark, what happens at Noah's Ark? Well, they had all those animals. 
Okay. Now you had clean and unclean animals in the Noah's Ark story too. And what was the difference between that? <clears throat> So you had seven of the clean animals, and you only had pairs of the unclean. Now, what's that supposed to mean in terms of God? What's he saying in that story? Well, the, the, the unclean. So in other words, with the purification of the flood, well, let's talk about what is killed and what isn't killed. What is killed in the purification by the flood of the world? Everything but what's in the ark. Everything but what's in the ark, exactly. Now, does God hate the unclean animals? No. He preserves them, doesn't he? In other words, he says, they have their place. They are mine too. But now the clean animals, he wants seven of them. Seven? Now again, when you hear male and female of all the animals, what are you thinking of? Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Two each. Yeah, they'll they'll be able to reproduce. Why does he want seven of the clean animals? Remember completeness. All right. So there, there's something going on with these numbers and with this story, and and so if you remember also this vision of Peter and he's sleeping at Joppa and God brings down a sheet and in the sheet the sheet is full of what? Unclean animals. And God tells Peter to what? Take and eat. Take, kill, and eat. And Peter says what? Oh no. <laughs> I've never done this. Okay. So so this is the framework that God has patterned Israel with. What does it mean that Ezekiel is spirited into the temple and he has to dig through the wall? I love that part. You gotta dig through the wall to get on the inside to see what's really going on on the inside. Well, what's going on on the inside? Look at in detestable things. It's not what it used to be. Well, Eden is corrupted. Eden is corrupted. And so. Now again, the, the problem isn't, oh, God hates bugs. You know, we, we might prefer to think that God hates mosquitoes um, and dangerous snakes if we, if that was, you know, rattlesnakes. Um, but, but the issue, again, is all connected to this whole worldview. And, and so portrayed all the wall, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals. Remember what we just said? Solomon had put into the temple. What was on the walls of the temple? The cherubim. They rightly belonged there. The fruit, the fruit trees. Well, again, this goes back to the garden. Well, now the garden is infested with all these other things. It, it, you know, Tolkien was a master of, you know, he was a Roman Catholic, a very devout Roman Catholic. And also, man, hugely knowledgeable in ancient mythology. If you watch the Lord of the Rings movie, whenever the servants of Sauron come, you have all these centipedes and spiders crawling out all over the place. The same thing that's happening here. And it's and again, now we're not saying centipedes are evil. Where it's a it's a way of communicating to us that Eden is being defiled. Who's defiling Eden? The Jews. Now why, now, now, you know, here he says at the beginning, he says, um, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary. Why will these things drive God far from his sanctuary? What happened? So Moses says to God one day, I want to see your face. Which leads us to wonder, because when Moses was with God and all of that, what he was seeing, we have no idea. But then Moses says, I want to see your face. And God sets up what arrangement? Moses, 
Okay, Moses has to go into the cleft of a rock. What does that mean? A crack. That's right. So if you imagine a big boulder or something, and there's a little, kind of a little crack into a rock, so you're all surrounded by rock. Why is it important that it's not just this? Why rock? That's right. I mean, I mean, again, if you read the Psalms, you are by rock. Rock in that, again, in that imaginary world, in the, in the biblical world, rock, iron. I mean, these are hard, strong things. So go into the rock. And then God says, I will walk. So, so Moses is this way. His face is to the rock. God is this way. And with Moses hidden in the rock, God passes this way. Now, why all of that set up? What is the point God is making to Moses? I'm a holy God. If you see me, you won't live. That's right. If you see me, you won't live. Now, what's up with that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say it. <laughs> why? Well, what might be some ideas why we can't see God? And why seeing God would make us die. And what's the deal with the story in the garden in Genesis when God says, the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And I remember as a kid, I remember reading that and I'm thinking, you know, well, we understand that if you eat poison fruit, you know, fall over, die. Well, we almost got that image now on Monday with the eclipse. Okay. Say more about that. Well, you know, when someone kind of tell you to be safe, most men and women kind of want to test safe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are some of us who say to us, wow, I, I trust you. I don't even have to look. But most people are not like that. So that is probably why he kind of, when he made the request, it was a simple request. And it's a normal request. Yes. You know, you kind of hate talking in the dark all the time. That's right. And you hate wisdom coming to you from the dark. So you do want to say, who are you? Let me see you. I trust you, but could I see you? If you trust me, you show yourself. So it's kind of a two-way thing. So, But the other person knows how strong they are and that that would put you unsafe. And you are a vessel of theirs, so therefore they wouldn't want you to be unsafe. Mm -hmm. So they protect you anyway. That's right. That's right. So, so let's get into Moses' side of this and say, what is with us that, let's imagine that, and C.S. Lewis actually has a book, Until We Have Faces, which gets into this somewhat. Um, let's imagine you had dealings with someone and they were always wearing a veil or behind a curtain or only spoke on the phone. After a while, just like Barbara said, what, what's behind this idea of we want to see them? Well, otherwise we feel like they're hiding something, maybe. Um, we want them to reveal everything. Maybe we want to be equal to. In other words, we want to be just like God. Yes. And, and also maybe we want a degree of control. There's this silly movie I saw where it's based on a true story where some people basically talk. Nobody in this movie is terribly bright. Some people basically talk a guy who works for an armored car company into making a really big heist. And like this is the biggest heist that's ever on record. I mean, this guy stole millions of dollars because he worked in the armored car company. And the guy who set this up, set it up through a woman that the armored car guy liked. And But this guy thought he was being really smart because he never, he made a point to never let the armored car guy know his name or see his face. The whole thing obviously came crashing down because the woman in the middle let the other guy, you know, it's a funny movie because they're all idiots. But, but again, part of it is, as human beings, to the degree that I see your face or I know your name, and, you know, remember, Moses first asked the name. Mm -hmm. it, it's an attempt at control. It's an attempt to get a handle on you. And God 
bless that in a little bit. Okay, you can have my name. But what's the third commandment? Thou shalt not take my name in vain. Well, what does that mean? First, first is, you shall not make an image of me. And the one after that is, and you better be very careful with my name. What's going on? <laughs> I don't know. I can't get you to yourself to God. That's right. He's saying, I am coming into a relationship with you, but you had better understand that this is not a relationship among equals. Now, who is more dangerous, a human being or a tiger? Tiger. <laughs> the human being. Yeah. The tiger's in the cage. Yeah. We tigers are in danger, but yet as human beings, when you approach a tiger, you, you know, is that cage safe? Uh, you know, because you understand how powerful a tiger is. And, and human beings, we have managed to have dominion over almost everything in our world, haven't we? But God comes to us and says, I am opening a relationship with you, but I am going to set up this relationship with the first rules to the degree that the first rule is, well, the, the Jews considered, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. That's the beginning of the conversation, which means the beginning of the conversation is, I, you owe your freedom to me. I chose you. I chose you. You shall have no other gods before me. I'm a jealous God. You shall not make anything that's in an image of me. You, I am not something that you can, you can play with. play with, control, manipulate. We can put a tiger in a cage. No cage for God. And I will give you my name, but you had better be very, very careful what you do with my name. Now, and so then with the deal with Moses, he's, he's trying to say to Moses, you know, Okay, I am going to, your back will have the experience of my back, you within the cleft of a rock, and then God declares his name, the Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate. That's what he declares. If you look up that passage in Exodus where, you know, where God grants Moses this request. But now, what is it about this idea that if you see me, you will die? And why is it that God... Well, why? Well, there are two things can happen if God stays with this sanctuary. What are they? One is that he leaves. What's the other one? What happens in with the tabernacle again and again in the desert wanderings when they violate the boundaries that God has set up? Die. Lots of people die. You know, and, and we can understand that with things like. Well, I'll tell you something. If I open up that light switch over there and take those two wires, the black one and the red one, and go like this, what will happen? I'll get a shock. If I go to Chernobyl and just stroll right in there, what will happen? But now we, well, is electricity our slave? Yes, it is. We're making it. We're managing it. We're manipulating it. We're careful with it. Except for lightning strikes. Except for lightning strikes. <laughs> but we're, you know, and nuclear reactivity. Well, that's our servant too, but we know something about it. Now, what about God? Not our servant. Not our servant. Now, now, what is this idea that even if we nearly see him, now, now think, now I want you to pause and I want you to think about, I want you to think about yourself. And now, again, he gets a lesson in this because of her vocation. Most of us have 
experience, either with ourselves or others, that someone has seen something. Someone has seen. There's no way to draw it. Someone, something has. Someone has seen something, and it has totally undone their world. Maybe you were out for a walk, or maybe you were going through papers at home and you discover something. What might you discover that would undo your world? He was adopted. He was adopted. <laughs> your parents have been lying to you all of your life. What else? You, maybe you're going through a bunch of papers and you discover letters to your spouse from maybe, you know, but bad, it's a stranger. Worse, it's your, friend. it's your friend. And you open that letter and you realize that your spouse has been cheating on you with your best friend or maybe even a family member for years. What does that do to you? It shakes your whole foundation. It shakes your whole foundation. Unless you were suspicious all along. I knew it! I knew it. <laughs> happened to me and you never stopped it. Did you know about it? Did you not know about it? Did you turn your eyes to it from it? Or you walk into your house and you find your mother bloody on the floor at the hand of your father. Now, I want you to think about these things. I want you to think about everything like that. Now, those are all negative things. Now, I also want you to think of what positive things unnerve us when we see it. What's the matter? Go ahead, you have an idea? Well, no, because my story would take too long. <laughs> the birth of a baby. Okay. There's just something that's so, I don't know. Know what word's magical almost? It's so big, it's so special that we can't quite wrap our brains around it. Let's let's think about envy. You were the prettiest girl at school. All the guys loved you, paid attention to you, wanted to be with you. New school start. New year starts. Someone comes into school making you look common. <laughs> How do you feel about her? Jealous. <laughs> no! Envious. Envious. Oh, another thing I've heard people say is that they like when you go to college and you're popular girl in high school and everybody likes you, you get to try to camp and you become so pretty and nice. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you just become a number on campus, and that's when you say that. And I've heard people say they try to teach their kids that. You know, when you get that, you just you know. That's right. That's right. Suddenly, your entire identity caves because you constructed your identity on your talent or your beauty or your smarts, and then you are confronted by someone who makes you look common. Now, if we think about the Lord. He is more than any of these two things combined. Mm -hmm. All of it put together. And so when you think about seeing God, when God says, you cannot see me and live, 
It's because it would crush us. But now, if in fact, and this gives us an insight into what sin is. Now, if you're the best, if, if you're the prettiest girl at school, and then you go to college and you find a girl who's prettier than you, if you were a completely humble, selfless person, would that shake you? Yeah. No. No. You'd say, no. Oh. Or if you were the best piano player in high school, and then you go to the music school and discover all these piano players better than you, and if you're a humble person, you would say, this is a wonderful opportunity. There's all these people that play way better than I can. I can learn from them, and I can enjoy their music. If you were a sinless person, you could say that. But we aren't. And we don't. And when we see God, we're undone. And so God comes into his temple and says, I have to leave. Well, the opposite of leaving is, I'll destroy you. And it's important that we get to, to part of why I'm getting at this stuff is, and as we go through this chapter, we get to chapter 9, where the judgment comes. And when you read that judgment, you're going to have the same experience as Ezekiel. You're going to gasp and say, no, Lord, don't do it. Because unless we understand chapter 8, and we understand all of the stuff that goes behind, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other God before me. Unless we understand that, we read these and say, oh, God is petty. Oh, God's petty. Um, are you petty? when you go through that stack of mail and find that your spouse has been cheating on you? Is that pettiness? No, no it isn't pettiness. You say, oh good, I'm glad my spouse has had a wonderful hidden relationship and lots of great sex with this other person over the years. That really makes me feel good about myself. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, unless you're like, oh good, well now I can tell about why, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and we see, see, and in all of this process, we begin to see ourselves as who we really are and what we're really capable of and what this means and what all of these stories of the Bible should teach us. Right time. Let's pray. Lord, you are a jealous God, and we are wayward people. We are the spouses that are stepping out on you all the time. And so instead of killing us, you sent the one image of yourself, and we killed him. And in that killing, we receive our freedom. So Lord, help us to learn this. Help us to know it. We couldn't understand Jesus or his death without knowing Ezekiel and the temple. Help us to understand how all of this stuff connects. Hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.